My name is Claudio Molo. I am an archaeological guide for the Campania region. The following presentation is just a brief. Pompeii is the archaeology, the only complete city of the ancient world. And this because of five main coincidences. First, built on the slopes of a volcano mountain that for many centuries remained dormant. This meant that the indigenous tribes felt confident to live here. Second, Pompeii was located near a navigable river and close to the seashore. This meant a closer access to the city and safer quayside in the center of the building. Third, our region is located on the border of two great civilizations, the Etruscans coming from center north and the Greek coming from south. This meant the meeting point of millenary experiences. Fourth, Pompeii was buried and not destroyed. That's why it could be dug out. Fifth, the city remained buried hidden for 1600 years. And while buried, nothing was built on it. What concerns the beginning of its history, there are archaeological evidences dating back to the 6th century BC. But to have Pompeii as a Roman municipality under all civil aspects, we have to wait until the 1st century BC. In this period, many Romans, politicians and wealthy entrepreneurs, fascinated by the beauty of the Bay of Naples, Began to buy lands in the Bay of Naples and built incredible residential palaces on the peninsula of Sorrento, on the Amalfi coast, Herculaneum, Stabia, and Naples. The importance of Pompeii as a large trading center was mainly due to the seaport organization, well equipped for cargo ships and docks along the Sano River. The primary economy was the production of excellent wine, olive oil, and the garum, which was a sauce paste obtained by fermenting the entrails of bluefish, adding then olive oil, vinegar, and aromatic herbs. The number of inhabitants who lived and worked in Pompeii during the first century AD has been estimated in about 20,000 slaves, freedmen, foreigners, and Roman citizens. To better focus the importance of this number, imagine that in the same period, the city of Paris was just a village of only 8,000 people. Pompeii was a cosmopolitan city. In a cosmopolitan bay, where la dolce vita of the empire was enjoying life. In Pompeii, you could meet businessmen coming from all over the Mediterranean Sea. On this slide, you can see Pompeii as it is today. You see here, the entire circumference of the city Here we have uh, the rectangular construction of the gladiators barracks and behind the largest theater in town. The distance from Pompeii to the Vesuvius volcano is 12 kilometers, seven miles roughly. This is as it is today. And this part of Pompeii, one fourth, is still buried, as you can see, Whereas on the right is the area of Pompeii as it was before the eruption. The mountain was a peak mountain of 6,500 feet, and the town was at only 300, 350 yards far away from the sea. The main eruption made the Bay of Naples retrieve for over two miles. The economic boom occurred at the very beginning of the first century AD. 
when the first Roman emperors decided to spend most of their time in their luxurious palaces on the Isle of Capri. Capri. On these two slides, we can see the portrait of Caesar Augustus Octavian, who lived in Capri and died in Nola, a city next to Pompeii during the year 14 AD. Then we can see in the center Tiberius, who stood in Capri up to the 37 AD and died in Misenus, a city next to Naples. And as well Caligula on the right, as a, the grandson of Tiberius, who was hosted on the island from the 31 to the 37 AD. On the next slide, we have three more personages beside the many that we had here in this bay, just to mention a few. On the left, we have the younger Agrippina, the last wife of Claudius and mother of Nero, living in the bay next to Naples. She was a victim of her excessive ambition to gain power. She believed that this was the only way for her to survive. As a woman, she could never occupy the throne. She could only rule through the men in her family. This she did under Claudius. Nero also felt persecuted by his mother, Agrippina, so he gave order to drone her in the Bay of Naples. In the center, we have Cicero. Cicero, too, had a summer residence in the Bay. He said that Naples is the city uh, where the suspicious become confident and the unhappy find consolation. Therefore, when I am annoyed, he said, with politics, I come to Naples to forget everything. And then on the right, we have as well Popea Sabina. She was born in Pompeii during the year 30 AD, and uh, she had the summer residence in Oplontis, just one mile west of Pompeii. The palace where she was living is still there in a great state of preservation. She became the second wife of Nero Emperor, but famous for her dissolute and shameless way of life. While this frenetic life went on rather well in uh, Pompeii, in 62 AD, an earthquake of uh, the sixth degree Richter scale devastated the war region. It was a wounding of the future disaster. Due to this event, the historians have estimated that 50% of the inhabitants fled the city. The eruption that buried Pompeii happened 17 years later, 17 years after the earthquake of 62. While works of reconstruction were still in progress, uh, we had the eruption. During this period, the area suffered of the seismic events and tremors, and the water sources started to smell of sulfur as well. But the lack of information and the active and full life they led did not help them to understand the seriousness of what would happen. The primary volcano, as you saw in the previous picture, was of 6,500 feet, called Summa. Well, this mountain exploded at 1 p.m. of October 24, an explosive eruption. This eruption led to collapse the southwestern wall of the mountain. Over 1,000 feet of the mountain was blown away, while a smaller cone was formed inside. So the Vesuvius crater of one and a half mile of circumference was born. A jet of volcanic debris, cinders, white hot pumice, ashes, and volcanic gravel were shot up to 15 miles of height. The shape of this cloud was like a mushroom, as we often saw uh, 
this kind of shaped cloud of an eruption. The sky of the entire region darkened. From the height, from the, the 15 miles of height, the volcanic material started to travel over the city of Pompeii, brought by the northwest breeze. Total panic in the town under the rain of this white hot ash and the white hot bullets of uh, cinders, white hot pumice stone. After six hours, uh, by seven o'clock uh, in, in the evening of the same day, the roofs of the building started to collapse under the tremendous weight of hot material. By 11 o'clock, Pompeii was buried under 13 feet from the ground floor. The eruption was classified as a cataclysm. Vesuvius is a stratovolcano, it means explosive. The Pompeians thought it was the end of the world. An inscription found in a house in Pompeii read, Sodom and Gomorrah, probably someone of Jewish culture wanted to refer to the biblical punishment. If we want to measure the lifestyle in Pompeii with modern ethics, there's no doubt. It was a dissolute city, a city of loose moral, with a relevant porno literature and paintings, with public brothel and private erotic clubs. At 11 p.m. of the same day, Due to the decreasing blast power from the magma chamber, the jet of volcanic debris that we saw on the previous slide, well, this jet of material started to collapse. So the volcanic material from the height of 15 miles fell on the slopes of the volcano, generating a succession of pyroclastic surges, as you can see on the picture here. The, in total were eight surges, one after another. The distance from uh, the crater to Pompeii, south east of the crater, it's of about eight miles, seven and a half, eight miles. This was covered in a few minutes that by the morning of uh, the 27th of October, 79 AD, after three days of eruption, there was nothing left visible. Pompeii lay buried under an average of 22 feet of volcanic material. The region around the Vesuvius volcano, as you can see from the picture on the right, was like a lunar scenery. After this apocalyptic disaster, ladies and gentlemen, the area remained deserted for years. It was a drastic change for this region, the business, the agriculture, the most basic supplies for life had disappeared. Most of the information concerning the eruption was reported by Pliny the Younger to the Roman Senate and found written in the books of Tacitus. Plin the Younger was living in Misen, the Bay of Naples, during the eruption. He was the nephew of Plin the Elder, the commander of the Roman Navy fleet, patrolling the western border of the empire. Plin the Elder led an expedition. Here we have the portrait of Plin the Elder. And this is the map where Pliny the Elder was living. This is the Bay of Misenus. He led an expedition from Misenus to Pompeii. Covering the distance of 17 nautical miles with his flagship. You can see the picture here on the right. In two hours. But at a certain point, he had to divert to Stabia due to the rain of volcanic material. According to the written report 
by the old Pliny the Roman to the Roman Senate, Pliny the Elder had to divert his route to the coastal city of Stabia to avoid the volcanic ash fall. Once here, he gave order to his crew to return to the base. The written dispatch says that Pliny the Elder passed away due to great difficulty. The poisonous gases did not spare him. A lot was left written concerning the Roman life in the Bay of Naples, but no information about the precise location of Pompeii. On this picture, we can see a copy of an original Roman map of the first century. We can see the cities are clearly marked. And if you pay attention, we can read Naples, we can read Herculaneum, and we can read Pompeii and Sorrento Peninsula here. This was the way of Naples. Hmm? The cities are marked, but uh, the day position is very uncertain. Road network included. We can see the North Africa coast, for instance, down below here. This is North Africa coast. With Tunis, the Tyrrhenian Sea, with the Bay of Naples, which is this one, where we read Naples and so on. The eastern coast, the Adriatic Sea, and the Dalmatia coast, where we read Spalato Split. We can see as well the rivers of our region, the Volturno, the Sili, and the Sarno. The Romans were excellent road builders, I have to say. Here we can see the main road of Pompeii of 16.4 feet wide. And as in Pompeii, the road drainage and sewer was almost absent. The streets were dirty and during the rainy days, like muddy rivers. Here, the picture of how to use stepping stones in order to cross the street in a clean and safe way. A curiosity. Wherever they have measured the distance of the chariot wheel mark of the wagon, it seems that the Romans were using a standard gauge, four feet, seven and a half inches. As I was saying, the surrounding of the Vesuvius mountain was deserted for centuries after the eruption. Titus was the emperor during this disaster. He donated a large amount of money from the imperial treasury to aid the victims of the volcano. He visited the Bay of Naples soon after the eruption and again the following year, but no work was done on recovery. So the area was abandoned. A few centuries later, we had the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The last Roman emperor died in Naples. Our country was devastated by the barbarians, and southern Italy was conquered from the 12th century to the 19th century by the Normans, first, then after the Swabian, then the French, then the Spaniards, the Minion, and at the end, the Bourbons. The official rediscovery of Pompeii is dated 1748 under the kingdom of Charles III of Bourbon. The city was explored by a Spanish military engineer who took away many statues to embellish the royal palaces of the Bourbons. They were actually exploring the place like moles. It was really a disaster. To have the proper digging, we have to wait the 1860s, soon after that Italy was unified under the kingdom of the Savoy family. At this point, the professional archaeologist, Giuseppe Fiorelli and then Amedeo Maiuri, were in charge. They dug out the city walls first, 
So knowing the circumference of the town, finally it was understood that Pompeii was a city of 164 square acres, roughly 66 hectares. To conclude, between exploration and excavation, it is now 270 years, and still one fourth of the city is buried. Now you probably wonder how come it took so much time. The answer is this. It's a question of priority. As during the last 270 years, we had to face several revolutions, plagues, famines, wars, eruptions, earthquakes, economics and political crisis. So Italy is a young democratic country. The Republic started only in 1946. As you can see from this picture, no machinery can be used while digging. The building were slowly brought to light, restored and made safe for visitors. It's an expensive and long work. On the right hand side, we can see an archaeologist pointing the border of the two different erupted volcanic materia. See? The first fall of volcanic material from 1 o'clock to 10, 11 o'clock in the evening, and then after the pyroclastic material that came down later at about midnight of the first day of eruption. A huge amount of volcanic material taken away from the excavation while digging was partially used to reclaim the land of the Vesuvius Valley. The volcanic ashes became hard around the entombed body of the Pompeians, casting their position. In the following months, the organic part of the figure, while decomposing, was absorbed by the ground and left an empty space around the skeleton. This missing part of the body was replaced by plaster. How? Well, the archaeologists, while digging, they were stomping the ground. And as soon as they could hear the echo, the resound coming from the cavity below, a series of holes were drilled connecting the cavity, through which liquid plaster was poured. The plaster, while filling the cavity, replaced the decomposed part of the body around the skeleton. Then, within a few days, for the plaster to become hard, freeing the place from volcanic material, the body made of plaster, but with the original skeleton in it, could be brought to light as a plaster cast. Here on the right, we can see a forensic factual reconstruction from a, a Pompeian skull. Here down below in the center, we have the only plaster cast of an animal, a, a dog that could not escape from Pompeii, could not run away from the city of Pompeii as it was chained. So the dog was burned alive, as you can see. That's why its body, it's all twisted. Here we have the agony of this man. He died exactly in this position as the one here on the left. Here the house of Menander named so because of a painting showing the Greek dramatist of Athenian new comedy. 
one of the most famous and better preserved house of Quebec. But according to the bronze seal found in the servant courtyard, the last owner was Quintus Popeus, related to the second wife family of Nero Emperor. He was a magister, actively working as a magistrate. The archaeologists are pretty sure about it, as the seal was used by the chief servant for making impression in wax or in clay or paper on behalf of the owner. Another important finding in his house was a wooden bed and a set of 118 silver cutlery and cups that you can see over here now in the archaeological museum of Naples. Most probably the house was found in a great state of preservation as the wealthy Quintus rebuilt it soon after the earthquake of the 62 AD. So it was a solid construction. The large theater had the capacity of 5,000 feet. The Pompeians as well as the Romans loved Greek comedies and tragedies. Sure. The performance were usually sponsored for political purposes. The audience could take seat according to their social status in three different sections. The most important were sitting on the lowest front part, still the original one, called actually Ima Cavea. Here guests could take place on a proper two-seater sofa called Biselia. The Biselia seats were found sculpted, as you can see on this picture over here. This is a Biselia. It's a sort of sofa where two persons could sit one next to another. Okay. It was found sculpted on a mausoleum as a status symbol. Imagine how important it was to have a Biselia seat in a theater. So the Ima Cavia is this one. Then we have the Media Cavia and the Summa Cavia that cannot be seen on this picture. The stage is this one, paved with wooden board. And the on the back, behind the stage, there is another rectangular construction that can be seen on this picture. These are the gladiators' barracks. On the right, we have the picture of one of the 40 bakeries that after the earthquake of the 62 were immediately rebuilt to grant bread to allow those who decided to remain in the city for the reconstruction. The oven, this one, and the grain mills over here were made of two different stones, basalt. The lower one with the conical shape was fixed to the base, and the upper one was biconical and concave and animated by a rotation movement. The grain that was poured through the upper funnel was shredded between the two contact surfaces and collected around the base in a form of flour. When the eruption began and Pompeii was shaken by the explosive power of the volcano, the bakers they flew away, leaving the bread in the oven. So the bread was found often in the ovens of the bakery stores of Pompeii, a bit overcooked, but still there. This whole painting that you can see out left was found in the house of the chaste lovers. It is like a film taken 2000 years ago. It shows a man having good time in a dinner party, but in a chaste way. In the center, a scene of initiation, 
this one over here, showing the young bride finding shelter in the matron slabs. On the right, yeah, an almost intact thermopolium was found along the main street of Pompeii. The counter with the terracotta container is still intact. The owner of this place was uh, a man with the name Petutius Placidus. A thermopolium is a, a place where hot food and drink were sold. The Pompeians, just like today, had a frugal meal for lunch, often standing on the road. Sandwiches with halibs, uh, cheeses, sausages, especially grilled fish with garum and so on. In the evening, the coupon, our thermopolium, was turned to be a sort of saloon pub with any kind of social entertainment, gambling included. A popular drink was called Muslim, a sort of wine cocktail diluted with honey and hot or cold water according to the season. Below, here, a painted Lararia, which was a shrine, it shows here in the center the figure of the ancestor who wears his toga in a priestly manner prescribed for sacrifices. Underneath, we have two serpents representing the generative power. In ancient Rome, terme, from Greek thermos, hot, usually refers to the large bathing and social activities. In the main section, there are four different rooms, plus a gym for physical activity. The first was a waiting room called Apoditerium for undressing, in which all visitors must, must have met before entering the tepidarium. Here we can see the tepidarium, where there are lockers all around where people could deposit their belongings. And here in the center, a large brazier made of runs as a heater system to increase the temperature and make it agreeable just to prepare the body for the great heat of vapor and warm bath in the Calidarium. A room with a bathtub and hot water. Here below, I have reported a double floor that we usually have under the room for hot bath and tepid bath, tepidarium as well in certain places. Through the double floor, hot air coming from the oven here on the right could circulate, increasing the temperature of the floor so that men could walk with the bare feet on a pleasant warm floor. The last room was called Frigidarium, where a circular marble basin with fresh water was waiting for all those looking for a thermic shock. The Temple of Apollo and his twin sister Diana. The statue of Apollo can be seen here on the right. Apollo was the deity mainly associated with the sun, music, beauty, and knowledge about the future. Often Apollo is represented while playing the lyre with the peak. For six months a year, according to the mythology, Apollo was living in the Hyperborean country, a land where he was learning about the future of human beings. This knowledge was then transferred to the siblings. In this temple, an elegant sundial was found. You can see over here. 
the sunlight hours started at six. So then the first hour was seven. The first line here on the left, midday is here in the center and 6 p.m. it's happy hour. during the sunny days, of course. In the same temple was venerated Diana, patroness of the countryside, hunters, and vital lymph nourishment. Both deities were sons of the chief of deities, Zeus and Latona. The oldest mosaic ever found are from Mesopotamia, third millennium BC. But the mosaic with patterns and picture became widespread in classical time, both in ancient Greece and Rome. Mosaic means the art of muses. Mosaics are made of tessere, which are the single square tiles made from colored marble, glassy paste, or even gold plated and lapis lazuli. Here we can admire a stupendous mosaic decoration of a fountain, still there in the house of the large fountain, with a marble basin, as you can see, a waterfall on the steps, on the marble steps here, and a, a bronze statue showing a cupid holding a dolphin spilling water. While here on the right, a closer view of the detail of a mask of Poseidon, the mythological god of the ocean. Today, most of the electronic screens are made of mosaics that we call pixel. We do not see them because they are very small, but the idea is the same. The left is still there in the house, this one here. The house of the orchard, excavated in 1951. Here one can easily admire paint the lemon tree, strawberry, cherry, and plum. In the center, a fig tree sheltering a snake, symbol of prosperity. Yeah. Since tools for making wine have found, were found in the house, it is believed that those, uh, this house might belong to a Liberto Winter. Probably was an Egyptian or Jew as the wall painting are clearly with scenes of, and symbols of the Egyptian and Jewish heritage. Something interesting is this painting down below here, the judgment of Solomon. The famous judgment of Solomon, uh, the dispute between two women, both claiming to be the mother of a child. Solomon, here on the podium, this is with the scepter, you can see. Revealed their true feeling and relationship to the child by suggesting cutting the baby in two. With each woman to receive half. Here is the baby, and here is actually the soldier with the sword. While the sword was about to fall on the unfortunate child, the real mother, to save her son, cried to give up the dispute to save him. So Solomon decided who the child belonged to. On the right here, a great mosaic, today in the Archaeological Museum of Naples, but from Pompeii. The artist dared to represent this woman with their younger aspect here 
and elder aspect here on the left. So it's a, an intriguing mosaic portrait. The incredible idea of this artist who gave to the lady the portrait in her young age and elder one. Up left the glass amphora, a stupendous glass artifact, used as a cinerary urn. After the manufacture of the blue vase, the same was covered with the, a layer of white glassy paste. Once the two layers were solid, the decoration was sculpted on the white layer. In this case, the decoration is showing a vintage scene. Stands out from the blue background. It is the same technique of the seashell canvas. Here we have a, one of the greatest mosaic ever found in Pompeii. Is a mosaic of the first century BC and is showing the battle of Gogomela. Gogomela is a city today in, uh, next to Mosul. And this, this battle took place in the year 331 BC. It was the battle in between Alexander the Great and Darius the Third of Persia. The mosaic was the tablinium floor from the house of the dancing form in Pompeii, probably the largest house in town, with something like 40 rooms. The mosaic was 19 feet long and 10 feet large. It was a real challenge to cut this mosaic in square pieces and reassemble it in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. In total, I have estimated uh, that the mosaic is made of one and a half million marble tiles. Down left here, surgical instruments found in a wooden box in a house in Pompeii, the house of the surgeon. And you can clearly see a specula, a retractor, a bronze catheter here, cups, blood telling, and scalpels found in the house of the surgeon, as I was saying. On the right, another important aspect of Pompeii is actually gamblers. So in this case, this painting, we have two people sitting, playing the Micazio, sort of mora. And you can see each player is simultaneously revealing their ends, extending any number of fingers, and at the same time calls out the number. The winner is the player who successfully guesses the total number of fingers revealed. Some games had been included on the blacklist in the Roman world because considered game of chance and forbidden to avoid, probably to avoid the larger wagers of money. Here too, we can see some dice that were found in town, of which Quite a few were found loaded now in the archaeological museum of Naples. Volcanology divides volcanoes in two major categories, effusive and explosive. The effusive are when the combustion from the magma chamber generates incandescent emission of minerals and metals called magma. These volcanoes, such as the Stromboli and Etna in Sicily, have a regular activity. Therefore, they do not accumulate explosive power. So this is an explosive volcano 
just like Mount Saint St. Helens in the state of Washington. This happens when uh, there is a solid volcanic plug and the pressure from generated by the heat in the magma chamber is not strong enough to uncork and make it explode. Last eruption of Vesuvius was in March 1944. But this danger, as you can see, is ignored. Two million people are living, embracing this mountain. It's an awful destiny. To excavate is to open a book written in the language that the centuries have spoken in the earth. I thank you for the attention you gave me and uh, I look forward to see you in the Bay of Naples in the next future. Goodbye.